All right, hello and uh, welcome so much to this uh, next session. Uh, so my name is Daniel, nice to meet you. Thank you for your interest. I'm gonna talk about DCM for evoke responses. And uh, just as a reminder, this is where we are uh, at in the course. So we have already heard about the principles of dynamic causal modeling. And I'm gonna talk about a specific flavor of DCMs for EEG, uh, namely DCMs for evoked responses. So today I'm gonna to take you on the DCM analysis path. We're gonna talk about what questions can be answered with DCM for ERPs, what you have to uh, think about when collecting, pre-processing uh, and analyzing your data. How do you specify a model or a model space? How can you invert a DCM? What you need to do to check the results? And then hopefully you will be able to answer your questions. So let's go into this. There are um, good and bad questions in the sense that some questions DCM can answer and is suited for answering and other questions are perhaps not so uh, good questions for DCM at least. There might still be interesting questions. So uh, the first question, um, which is a good question is, does the network with regions A, B, and C explain my data better than the network with regions A and B only? This is uh, already an interesting question because this is a question that DCM for EEG can answer in some cases, but DCM for fMRI can't because in DCM for fMRI, you uh, would extract data from a source and similar in DCM for EEG, but if you use, for example, ELF, uh, LFP measures, you could also not answer this question. And the reason is that when you compare different models, you should always compare models that have been fit to the same data. Usually, in the case for ERPs, we fit the model to uh, all the scalp data or electrodes. So in this case, you can actually answer the question of whether uh, a network with regions A, B, and C, or a network with regions A and B only, would be a better explanation, but keep that in mind. Uh, a second question could be, are regions A and B linked in a bottom up uh, or top down or recurrent manner? You could also ask, how does my experimental manipulation, for example, administering a substance or uh, asking participants to direct attention to something in an experiment changes the effective connectivity between reg regions? or within the regions, uh, within the region, we also see examples for that. And another question you could answer is what the EEG signal would uh, I expect if I increase the connectivity even further? This is a simulation question. So you can simulate from the DCM and see what happens if you increase or decrease a connection. You can perform virtual lesion experiments uh, or just try to understand your model parameters. Questions that are less uh, good for DCM is, and, and this is from based on practical experience. Uh, uh, so uh, it can happen that people uh, will approach you and they say, you know, like I've done this ERP analysis, I haven't found any effects in the data. Can't you, you've been to this SPM course now, can't you uh, just model the data with DCM to find some cool effects? And then we publish a nice paper on it. And I would definitely. Uh, recommend not to do that. And the reason is that you should view DCM as an explanation of an effect that is already there. So you still need to establish with uh, some sort of classical statistics method, like uh, uh, you could use SBM, but you can also use other software, cluster-based significance testing, or um, look at your P amplitudes or whatever, but you should make sure there is an effect that, that you can expect that you can then later explain with DCM. But it does not, it, it's not a substitute for that. Another uh, question that's not so good, at least not for the implementations of DCM in, in SBM, is how does the connectivity change within our 200 region network? And the simple reason for that is that um, the model, as you will see later, is quite complicated and uh, has a lot of free parameters. And if you model a large network with 200 regions, then this would scale up. Uh, it, it would mean you have to estimate 
hundreds or thousands of parameters. And um, this is this tool is not built for this purpose, let's say, let's put it this way. You probably just get some uh, yeah, meaningless parameter aspects. Of course, there are versions where people try to simplify the model and make it scalable to more regions. But uh, in the SVM versions, I would not recommend using 200 regions. Uh, another question is how does the connectivity change within our 20 region network? Also, this is actually too much. I would uh, in practice, I have not seen models going beyond six regions, uh, even though there might be, but I would definitely not recommend it even six regions is uh, potentially pushing it. All right, when it comes to the data, of course, you have to first collect your data and then uh, we get to the pre-processing steps. So you uh, follow you, the usual pre-processing steps as you would for an ERP analysis, analysis you downsample the data. Uh, I would recommend uh, downsampling much more strongly. And there's, there's some nice work from Dario Shirby uh, showing that actually it's or he recommends to downsample the data, and the reason for that is that um, the that SBM assumes that data points are fairly the noise is not uh, very correlated across time points, and to make this assumption valid, you need to downsample quite drastically. Then you also need to filter your data, epoch, uh, remove artifacts, and then uh, you can you should average to increase signal to noise either per subject, or uh, you can also average across subjects. So use a grand average subject to model the data or to model a grand average uh, effect, for example. These are different options. Then you still have to do a classical analysis. So I definitely, as I said before, I would definitely recommend that uh, you make sure that there are effects because if there are no effects and your parameter, your model still shows significant group differences and parameters, it's not quite clear whether this is sort of um, truly there. Uh, you can use simulations to try to see if the effects go in the expected directions. But if there is literally nothing in the data, then it's more likely that these parameter differences are just an artifact of the model inversion. And I, I, I personally would not trust them very much. And yeah, as I mentioned before, TCM should be thought of not as a tool, not as a statistical test, but as a tool to explain this effect that is already there. All right, so um, the next step, uh, now you have a good question, you have your data, it's pre-processed, you have effects, all good. Uh, so how do you translate your question into a model comparison or a parameter inference problem? Because th these types of problems can be solved using DCM. For this, you will need to select regions, select the variant of DCM, for example, the ERP model, which I will be talking about in this uh, lecture. You need to and you need to specify connectivity architecture. And I will walk you through all of these steps. So let's start with how do you translate your question into a model comparison or a parameter inference problem. So here are some examples. Uh, one question could be, is my task activating T and V1 or only V1? So we're comparing networks of two different sizes. So one way to, uh, to visualize this is to use these uh, model or read network diagrams. And you can see that this would basically come down to a model comparison question where you compare a model that has only V1 to a model that has uh, V1, which is connected to MT. A second example is uh, the second question here, are backward connections switched off when individuals are sleeping? So you could compare a model that has both forward and backward connections to a model that has only forward connections. And you would hope that if this model comparison favors the model without the backward connections, when you fit it to sleep data, uh, then this would suggest that uh, backward connections are uh, uh, switch off when individuals are sleeping and would answer your question. Now coming to parameter uh, parameter inference, uh, a, a question for this. So sometimes it's not about whether the connection is actually present or absent, but it's more a question of the degree of connectivity. If you think about um, pharmacological interventions, for example, they rarely switch, it off, uh, switch connectivity off entirely, but they might increase it a bit or decrease it. 
So uh, this could also be due to experimental manipulations, for example, attention. So uh, one parameter inference question could be this question here is attention increasing forward connectivity. So you would actually uh, fit the same model to, every, uh, to everybody. And then you would look at the model parameters for this forward connection here and compare those model parameters across the two groups. And if this question should be answered yes, and you would find that uh, the parameters in the group or in the condition where participants attended to, let's say, a visual stimulus should be increased compared to the case where they did not attend to the stimulus. All right, so now you have translated your question into a model comparison or a parameter inference problem. Next, you have to select the regions you want to model. How do you do that? So you can go uh, to the, you should definitely check the literature and see what, what's out there. So there might be a meta-analysis on this task if you use a task that has been used uh, a lot before, like the mismatch negativity task, for example. Um, alternatively, maybe you have run your own fMRI study and have used uh, this task in fMRI as well. And you can then use the regions that are activated in the fMRI uh, as regions that you model with the DCM. Or if you don't have MRI and you also there's no, nobody has done this task yet. You could uh, do a source reconstruction of your EG data. Uh, you can think, actually, you can think of DCM as an extended source reconstruction itself, uh, which makes additional assumptions about what's going on in that region. And uh, I would still recommend to do a, a, a regular <laughs> vanilla source reconstruction just to see, like, uh, to, to yeah, select this network that you want to model, for example. Um, and there's also the option in, DC, uh, in, in the DCM GUI to let the regions uh, move a little bit. And it's called dipole fitting. Um, in case your information is not that reliable, you could, you could also do that. But, I would certainly recommend at least doing a source reconstruction, see how much of the signal you can actually explain with these regions. Yeah. And uh, this is this is what it looks like in SPM. So this is the GUI. And uh, yeah, the network is specified in these blocks here on the left-hand side, you give the region a name, for example, left A1. And then on the right-hand side, you specify the center of the region, uh, in terms of MNI coordinates. All right, now comes a more difficult step. You have to select a variant of DCM. So actually DCM for ERP is not just one model, but there's lots of different models. And there's this beautiful paper by Pereira and colleagues, which I strongly recommend if you want to uh, read a guide through the jungle of different DCM models. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot go into this here because uh, it would just be beyond the scope of, of a, a one hour presentation. But I recommend this paper. And uh, I have this nice figure here where you can see different choices you need to make. So the first choice is the choice between convolution based DCM and conductance based DCM. Here are some example models in SBM, the ERP model, which I will specifically talking about today but there's also a CMC model, a model fit to LFPs, which is uh, a model that I also mentioned earlier. And these models are essentially based on Wilson and Cohn and Jensen and Ritt type of uh, modeling. And then there's also conductance-based DCM, which uh, models the uh, conductance in neuronal populations and different receptor types, uh, specifically the NMDA, AMPA, and GABA receptors. And it's based on the Hodgkin and Huxley model of the squared axon, uh, which has been scaled up to a neuronal population with Morris and Decker's uh, formalism. So how do you choose between these two choices? Well, the simple question is, if you're interested in the ion channels, you need to go for a conductance based. Otherwise, I would strongly suggest to use convolution-based DCM. And the reason for that is that it tends to be uh, better behaved uh, and more robust. So I would I would suggest that you go with a simpler model in case you don't need a com more complex model, uh, model to answer your question. 
The next choice is how many pop neuronal populations do you model? You can model three or four populations uh, currently in SPM. So the three population model, the ERP model, for example, includes parameter cells, spiny stellate cells, and inhibitory interneurons. And these parameter cells uh, are assumed to be both in superficial and deep layers. And because uh, there were some theories that suggested that uh, predictive coding might be linked to, to deep and um, superficial cells in different ways, this uh, canonical microcircuit model was also introduced, which uh, separate, separates this population uh, of parameter cells into deep and superficial cells. So uh, when do you pick which model? Well, the simple answer is if you want to test uh, predictive coding, uh, then you should probably go with a four population model, or if you expect specific effects in either the deep or superficial parameter cells because of an intervention or because your hypothesis is that the predictive codes are more likely to be found in the superficial cells regardless of predictive coding, then something like this might be interesting to you. Otherwise, you can go with a classical Jensen and Ritt uh, three population model. Uh, then there are different, <laughs> different choices. Uh, so basically you can see that uh, there are mean field models which consider both the mean and the covariance of a neuronal population. I will go into this into more detail, but it's just so that you can come back to this if you make these choices and think about what matters to you. And then there are neural mass models, which are a bit simpler. It's a special case of the mean field model where you only uh, look at the mean activity of populations. And then there's, there are also neural field models, which uh, consider also the spatial dimension uh, uh, of this canonical microcircuit. So how do you choose between those? Um, so basically uh, the uh, mean field model, which models both the mean and the covariance and the neural field model can both express more complex dynamics. Um, so my recommendation would be to go there if this is needed. Otherwise, I would recommend to stick to the simpler model. So in most cases, neural mass models will be fine and the safer choice. All right. Um, the ERP model. So I will now walk you through this example of the ERP model. We go uh, in, in a lot more depth now, <laughs> um, but I think it will be useful because a lot of the principles would also apply to the canonic microcircuit and uh, just for you to get an idea and, you know, like see, get an intuition about what these equations mean. And then and I will also highlight where certain assumptions are made and what could be wrong with these assumptions potentially and what you should think about when you when you are using these models. All right, so as a quick recap, we have to think about what do we actually measure with EEG. So um, as you uh, may know, we have a lot of neurons in the brain, <laughs> uh, hopefully, and uh, and uh, you can see that uh, some of these neurons tend to have like a more positive charge around the soma of the cell and a more negative charge around the dendrites. Of course, they are different. They have different shapes. These neurons. Some have like this nice apical dendrite. Others have uh, branched out uh, <laughs> dendrites all around the cell. But uh, the difference between these po positive charges and negative charges generates an electric. Uh, electric field. And for most cells, this cancels, cancels out either because the dendrites are shaped in a way that's surrounding this positive pole, or because there's a neighboring uh, neuron that has like it's flipped basically and these fields cancel. But in some cases, if there are enough neurons uh, that have a certain shape and are oriented uh, similarly, and this tends to be the neurons that have uh, these long apical dendrites, so the parameter cells with the long apical uh, dendrites uh, that are oriented oblique to the uh, cortical surface. This can be then picked up, this electric field can be picked up with the EEG sensors. And uh, leads to measurable dipoles in these sensors. 
and you can um, you can think of this also here. Uh, so if if we have no no dipoles in the head, then there would be no change in the electrical field across sensors. If we put one dipole into the head here, you can see that this then leads to a difference in uh, in electrical potentials in the sensors here. And um, you can think of this one intuition is uh, if you imagine a, a big balloon and you put a, a, a torch light inside the balloon and then you turn it on, you can see the shade of this light shining through the balloon and this is what this would look like. And then if you add more dipoles, these shapes become more complex uh, and maybe uh, also more realistic in terms of what we can actually see in the EEG data. So uh, people who work with EEG should be familiar to shapes like like these ones here, for example. And if the neurons become active and inactive uh, over time, uh, these uh, dipoles change over time, the electric activity changes over time, and this leads to a change in the measured uh, EEG. And this is uh, in the measured scalp potentials. And this is what we record with EEG. Of course, now with DCM, the question that we want to address is, can we make inferences about properties of the neuronal source that generated these signals? So in reality, what we're doing is we measure this, but we have a lot of questions about the neurons. So uh, how do we get there? And the way to get there is we first have to specify what's called a forward model. So this is a set of rules that uh, tells us how do we uh, get from the neurons, how how do the changes in the neurons translate to the measured scalp signal? And this, of course, is quite a challenging problem. So we have to traverse many different spatial scales here. We are starting at a single cell, which is only a couple of microns, uh, to a cortical column, which is populations of neurons, uh, up to brain network, uh, which can cover like large proportions of the of the brain to whole. Uh, brain scalp potentials, basically. So we need to define every step of this uh, transition, basically. And we will start uh, at the mesoscale. So if we think about a neuron, uh, this is here. These are the dendrites. Uh, this is the soma. And this, these are the axons. Or is the axon, sorry. Uh, we can think of the neuron. So how could we simplify what this neuron does? And basically, um, if we think about it very simplistically, the neuron does two operations. One, it receives input uh, here at the dendrites. Spikes of presynaptic cells arrive and are converted into postsynaptic potentials. Two, and also uh, then this uh, postsynaptic potential is converted again into a spike at the axon. So these are the two basic operations that uh, a neuron does. And uh, going to the first operation, the input, this can be modeled uh, using a synaptic response kernel, which is derived from measurements. This is the equation here. Uh, and uh, what this kernel essentially does is uh, it's the response to a delta input, uh, how a delta input would translate to a postsynaptic potential. And it's described, this function is described by two parameters. You can see on the x-axis is time, on the y-axis is the membrane potential, and the two parameters are h and tau. And we can use simulations to understand what these parameters do. Uh, and on the next slide, but basically what this function is doing, it's a convolution of the incoming neuronal activity with a synaptic kernel. So we are looking back in time and computing a moving window rolling sum. So we are doing a convolution here, and this is why the model is called convolution-based DCM. If we change the first parameter, h, we can see that this scale is the maximum postsynaptic potential. And if we scale the second parameter, tau, you can see that this makes the response or the postsynaptic potential more extended in time. And these are the parameters that are actually used in SPM FX ERP in this function, which is implementing the Jensen-Drit version of DCM. 
And you can see that they differ quite drastically between the excitatory uh, synapses and the inhibitory synapses. So in this model, there are two different ones. And the inhibitory is much larger and longer than the excitatory one. And if we go back to the original work from Janssen and Britt, uh, which I would highly, highly recommend uh, to read, then you can see that uh, they, they basically argue that this uh, inhibitory uh, synapse tends to be closer to the soma of the cell, and therefore its effect on the uh, the EPSPs that arrive in the soma, or IPSPs in this case, would be much larger compared to the excitatory synapse, which tends to be further away. And uh, when the signal travels through the dendrites, it's reduced. So this is why they choose this difference in the in the different uh, synaptic kernels. Yeah. Okay, so now we have this input conversion going to the output. Here we need, so we need to specify how postsynaptic potentials are converted into a spike. And the simplest way to think about this is uh, a step function. So basically, if the membrane uh, potential increases, at some point there will be a firing threshold. And uh, if that threshold uh, is exceeded, there will be a spike. Of course, uh, now, if we think there could be not just one parameter cell, but multiple parameter cells, maybe some more, and they could have slightly differing, uh, different firing thresholds. If we then average over these firing thresholds, we uh, arrive at the sigmoid function here. And this is called a, a mean field approximation. And one way to, to think about this intuitively is, uh, if you look at this swarm of birds, yeah, I hope you can see it in the video. Sometimes it doesn't work properly. So imagine a swarm of birds moving around, if that's not working. Um, and each bird is moving in a yeah, in, in, in this swarm. And you now you could go ahead and describe the, the movement direction of each bird, or you could describe the mean of the swarm and see where this is moving. So the the intuition behind the mean field approximation is essentially that you may already be able to tell some something interesting about the system if you describe where the mean of the system is moving. Uh, and this is the idea that we are using here in DCM. So the idea that we can describe the mean of a neuronal population, and this will already tell us something interesting about the brain. All right, this sigma function has two free parameters, E0 and R, and you can see that E0 parameterizes the maximum firing rate. Here, uh, if it's larger, there's a higher firing rate and one also one difference between the SBM implementation and the Jensen and Grid. The original model is that an uh, SBM models the deviation from a mean firing rate. So uh, there are negative firing rates in the sense that they are less than the, the average firing rate, whereas Jensen and Grid formalizes it in absolute terms. So there's only zero or positive firing rates. And R describes the stochasticity. If R is more positive, this function becomes more like a step function. You can think of this as the, the dispersion between the thresholds of these neuronal populations being closer together. And if it becomes uh, smaller, then uh, it becomes uh, more stochastic responses become more stochastic or the firing thresholds of this population seems to be more dispersed. And the sigma function is one of the reasons why or is the is why it introduces nonlinearities in the, in this model. So this makes the model nonlinear. And I can show you why or like what the effect of this is in the simulation. So let's assume that we have a delta function input which is scaled by parameter C into this one region here. And now we can see what happens when we change C. So for small and medium values, you uh, get a, a response uh, in the parameter cells here that you measure from. And that becomes larger. They notice that there's a difference on the y-axis here. So it becomes larger with more input, which makes sense. But then as you move towards this uh, saturated part of the sigmoid function, you actually don't get the same increase anymore and these nonlinear behaviors start to emerge. So you cannot uh, simply add the response to two inputs 
to compute the response to twice the input. Instead, there is non-linearities here. We will get less activation here because of the saturation effect. All right, uh, so just to recap, we have seen how we can use a synaptic response kernel or a convolution uh, to convert spike rates of, uh, of presynaptic cells into postsynaptic potentials and to convert the output of this population uh, to convert the postsynaptic potentials into an average spike rate. We can use the sigmoid function. And you may have noticed that we have already move closer to the meso scale here because we are now talking about a lot of neurons, a uh, population of neurons when we did the mean field approximation. Uh, so we have already not quite at the micro scale anymore, but we've moved up a step. So uh, we're gonna move up further. So what happens when you don't just have one population, but you actually have multiple populations. So now how can we model an area or a cortical column and as I've already alluded to in the introduction, there are different uh, models with either three or four population uh, populations of neurons. And the most popular ones are uh, the ERP model here based on Janssen Ritt and the canonical microcircuit model. And uh, uh, even though I will go into the details of the ERP model, I wanted to give you a, a brief outlook of the canonical microcircuit model so that you have also you also know the literature where you can read up on the different versions of that. So the original microcircuit was introduced by Douglas and Martin in 91. And you can see that it has changed over time. And I would uh, suggest that if you're interested in this model, you could look at these um, papers and read up on it. And it's also one way to show that there is still debate about which microcircuit and wiring is the best way to model this. And you can see even uh, Outside the SBM bubble, <laughs> there's lots of different ways that uh, this cortical column has been modeled for different reasons. So this is still a somewhat unresolved question, even though all of these models have an excitatory and inhibitory population, um, which is something that yeah people tend to agree on. All right, going back to Jensen Red. So we have these three populations. In red, we have the inhibitory cells. Then we have the spiny stellar cells, which are in layer four. Inhibitory are in both uh, top and bottom layer. And pyramidal cells, uh, so three populations. So how do we, we, uh, we need to connect them? And we can call these connection parameters gamma, gamma one, two, three, and four. But the question is, how do we know what the value of gamma should be. And Janssen and Ritt um, based these parameters. So they came up with ratios uh, based on counts of synapses, uh, based on animal studies in, in mice, and cats, uh, and visual cortex. And they uh, basically defined different ratios between these parameters. So if you know gamma one, which is the only parameter here, then gamma three and four would be 25% of the connection strength of gamma one, and gamma two would be 80% 80 strength, uh, 80 strength. But of course, uh, this can also be you know, different uh, in disease. It could be different in humans compared to these animals. So um, I just wanted to highlight where these parameter values come from. It also differs across different uh, DCM models. All right, so next, moving up, now we have a connected cortical column. We know roughly how strong these connections are. Uh, now we need to uh, identify a network. We pick our favorite four sources, and let's say in this case. Uh, but how do we connect the sources, right? So that's the next problem. We have done our source reconstruction, or I have a beautiful fMRI study, which gave us these four sources. So how do we connect those? And uh, in DCM? Uh, or an SPM. This is based on work from Fellman and Van Essen, uh, which you probably know. You know this. Uh, you've probably seen this beautiful wiring diagram lots before. But basically, uh, this is based mostly on studies in macaque monkeys and visual areas. Uh, and the idea or uh, the finding was that there seems to be different connectivity profiles 
based on the position in the cortical hierarchy that an area has. And uh, Feynman and Van Essen derive pretty strict connectivity rules between lower and higher areas or what constitutes uh, a feedback and a feed forward connection. And uh, more recent work has suggested that it might not be as strict uh, in, in Markov's work, you can, you can read up on it, but basically the idea is that it might be more gradients and not so strictly deterministic, but um, in uh, SBM, it's based on, on this work. And you can see that uh, based on this, forward connectivity originates in supergranular, infragranular layers uh, and targets layer four, whereas top down uh, targets the superficial and deep layers, and lateral connections target all three layers. Of course, uh, now we have reduced our problem of how do we connect each of these sources with, with each other to knowing the uh, position of the hierarchical area. So if we know that, then this simplifies the problem. This is uh, mainly the case for areas where we already know, or, or for areas where we already know a lot. For example, visual cortex is quite well understood in terms of the hierarchy. So then it can be really helpful. But of course, there can be potential problems if you don't know the hierarchical position of, of an area. Uh, for example, it might be much harder to say whether uh, the MPFC or BMPFC is higher up the hierarchy. So there are certain areas where it's not quite clear yet yeah, which is higher up. So then it, it, it's still a bit difficult to deal with. The second problem with this is mostly based on visual areas. And the question is, does it translate to other areas? Probably it translates well to other primary, uh, primary sensory areas, but maybe there are exceptions in front of prefrontal cortex or subcortical structures where it's much harder. Um, and it's also based on areas with a six-layer structure. So some of the regions, either subcortical that we are interested in, don't have a six-layer structure, or uh, even uh, other areas like cingulate cortex or even cortical regions like motor cortex, which is a granular, does not have the same uh, structure as visual cortex does. So this is something to, to keep in mind when you're using the model just to make sure yeah, that you know that you're making certain assumptions which may or may not hold. And now that we have all that, we know uh, what populations we model, we know within the population what connectivity there is, and then uh, we can connect them. This gives us this uh, system of differential equations, and we can zoom in a bit. Zoom in a bit. And you can see that it looks quite complicated, especially if you see it for the first time. So uh, yeah, don't, don't be afraid. I'm going to try to walk you through it uh, in more detail. But you might already recognize some of the things I've been talking about. You can see here the cameras. So these are the intrinsic connections. You can also see these parameters age and tau that I've been speaking about. So there is uh, some things of the things that I told you about. And uh, yeah, let's break it down. All right, just to remind you, each population essentially performs a convolution where you have the input is convolved with this synaptic curve here. And this gives us this uh, uh, integral equation. And um, so this is a retarder, retarded integral. So we look back in time. Uh, what happened at time point t minus delta, so a little bit in the past. And then uh, we multiply this uh, input with a value of uh, the synaptic kernel at this time, and then uh, uh, sum it up, integrate over it. All right, so this, if you wanted to, the integrals are a bit difficult to deal with. Uh, so sometimes it's easier to describe actually not where the system is at exactly, but how it changes over time. So we can use this, uh, we can use differential equations for that. And you can apply some mathematical tricks, which I will not go into in this tutorial, uh, to transform this into a, a system of ordinary differential equations. Uh, and where you have two, two first order differential equations, 
uh, the first uh, describing the change in voltage and the second describing the change in current. And uh, you can see that uh, this part here is a function of input. So this is the part that we will uh, take a closer look at and we will uh, ignore the second part for now, which is uh, these terms which just depend on the current itself and the voltage in the population. So let's break, uh, break this part down for each of the different populations. So if we look at the inhibitory cells here, you can see that here we have again the parameters of the synaptic kernel, so the excitatory kernel for all of these. So all of these must be excitatory connections. Uh, and you can see that the input into the inhibitory cells is determined by whatever comes from the parameter cells of a different region through backward connections, that's the CB here, what comes through lateral connections, and what comes from the parameter cells within that population. And all of these are just added. That's it. Then for the spiny stellate cells, you can see that this receives input from other sources through forward, lateral, uh, and lateral connection, and then also as uh, input from the parameter cells. And each of these corresponds essentially to one of these lines here in this diagram. And the stellate cells also re uh, receive the thalamic input, so the input into the system in general. When you specify this as an input region, then there will be a non-zero input here. For the parameter cells, we have two terms. One is the excitatory part. So everything that excites the cell uh, comes from through backward connections or lateral connections from other regions, or it comes from the spiny stellate cells in the same region. And then there is also an inhibitory part here, which is basically just the signal that uh, the inhibitory, the red arrow here, what the inhibition sent from the inhibitory interneurons. And then to compute the activity of these parameter cells, you would just subtract the excitation from the inhibition and the other way around. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, and now if we look at these equations, I think you, you will start to recognize uh, some of the things. Again, so we have this, these pairs of equation. Each of these pairs describes one of these populations, except for the parameter cells, where we have two pairs and an equation that is the difference between the two. And uh, you can see exactly uh, the same things. They're just like, nota the notation is slightly different because you, yeah, you just, uh, you have these brackets here, but this is what these equations mean. And I hope this was um, helpful for you. And now you you can look at this and, and at least have an intuition of what's going on here. All right, so let's uh, try to understand this a little bit more through uh, just a range of simulations. So in this simulation, we get an input, delta function input, uh, weighted by, by input strength C. And then we just connect five regions with the uh, same forward connectivity strength. And uh, this is the uh, activity of the parameter cells measured in every area. And you can see that the width of the response to this input changes from area to area. You can see that it becomes more dispersed, increasingly more dispersed, the higher you go up this hierarchy or the more regions are in a row. And you can see here that uh, the synaptic kernel acts as a low pass filter. So you may, may, uh, you may remember from uh, EEG preprocessing that you use filtering uh, to get rid of artifacts. And essentially the synaptic kernel acts as a filter you can see that if you want to get more enduring and longer and later responses, you can just uh, chain more regions together. All right, next simulation. So we again have an input, uh, region one and region two, fixed forward connectivity, but now we're going to change the amount of backward connectivity and see what happens. The black line is activity in region one, the gray line is activity in region two. You can see here, uh, if there is almost no backward connectivity, then you just get a response in region one and a slightly weaker response in region two. And now as we increase the backward connectivity, you start to see these dampened oscillations. And uh, 
for those of you familiar with ERPs, this is essentially what we're looking for because ERPs pretty much look like a damp dampened oscillation, right? So this is a regime that we can use to model uh, ERPs. And then if you increase further, you can see that these oscillations increase uh, in magnitude over time. At some point, they will saturate. You can see these yeah. uh, oscillations go on and on forever. So now uh, we have specified the brain network, how they're connected. We have tried to understand the whole set of differential equations. Um, so how can we actually do this in SPM? This is the SPM GUI. You can see here at the top, you can select the model, the ERP model, for example. You can choose the time window. You can choose, uh, you, uh, yeah, you input the data. And down here, you specify the connectivity. You, you will hear more about these things in Julia's tutorial. So don't worry if it's a bit rushed. I just wanted to give you a primer here. But basically, you have these different uh, matrices here where you can specify the, con the connectivity. For example, in the input column, you can say the first region, which is determined by the order of areas here. So A1 is the first region, left A1, receives an input. And these connectivity matrices uh, read as, uh, you have to go from the column to the row. So this is the way to read it. So this is from region three to region, uh, from region one to region three. Um, yeah, from region one to region three, forward connectivity. Uh, this would be from region two uh, to region four. Backward connections are here from region three to region one, and so on. So this is how we specify the, 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 this connectivity in SVM. And now the last step, now we have the network. How do we get to the scalp potentials? And luckily, after all these equations, this is a very simple step. So. Now, uh, in the case for EG, this is, becomes very simple. So you just use a linear mapping uh, using this lead field matrix, which you may be familiar with from source reconstruction. You multiply the activity of each source with, with this lead field matrix, and then there's some error. And this is how you get your scalp response. And this is also a difference between DCM for EG and fMRI. So in fMRI, you have a quite a, a simple model or what's going on in each source, but then you have a very complicated model that uh, that uh, parameterizes this ma mapping here, the balloon model. Whereas in ET, you have quite a complicated model of what's going on in each source, and then you have just have linear mapping from the activity to scalp. So this is luckily the e easiest step <laughs> in this case. All right, uh, so now we've done it. We have bridged um, a lot of different spatial scales and have specified a full forward model. And now we have to uh, reverse the direction. So now we can uh, invert this model and try to answer this question of whether we can make inferences about properties of the neuronal sources that generate these signals. And uh, now will be another one hour talk about how this is done. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, you've heard about free energy uh, potential already in this course. If not, you still will. And uh, in practice, uh, for the user, this is uh, pretty simple. You just press this button here. Um, and then you have to wait for it. And then you will get some output and uh, you can look through the output, Julia will show you some of it. So you can see uh, one, for example, one output here, you can see the observed responses, so what you measured, and the predicted responses, so what is predicted by a model. And of course, and we have spoken about model comparison and other stuff a lot, uh, but, but basically what you don't know yet, even if you know that this model is better than that model, is it a good model, right? Yeah. Free energy doesn't tell you if it's a good model. It can tell you it's a better model than something else or a better parameter than something else. But to look to see whether it's a good model, you should uh, 
to, you should compare these uh, the predicted and observed responses. And uh, you can just eyeball them. That's the first thing you should do. You can also try to quantify, quantify it, look at, compute some sort of variance explains, although this might be problematic for nonlinear models. So you could use different measures, distance, co distance correlation. But uh, before you ask this, there's no um, threshold after which you say this is a good model if it's 70% variance explained or something. It's uh, There is no fixed threshold. So instead, I would suggest that you actually look, does it visually look the same? Uh, you can use these uh, uh, quantified, uh, that these, um, let's say, variance explained to, to find subjects which you should inspect, which might have problems. And especially, you should also pay attention to the data features that you actually want to explain. Usually we are not in interested in everything, but in certain ERP components, for example. So check whether your model actually has explained, let's say, a change in, in the mismatch negativity. So uh, comparing these two, this looks good. Maybe if it would look like this, you would say, oh, that we might need to improve this. And what do you do to improve it? You have to go back to the beginning basically. So first you would check your data, did something go wrong with the preprocessing, are there artifacts, is there high frequency noise, is, some, yeah, is there something that I missed? Next, if you've confirmed, okay, the data looks good, you have to check your sources, is there maybe a relevant source that you have not considered in your network you should be modeling? Uh, you should also check your model, can you, if you simulate from your model, can you produce the effects and simulations? Uh, or do you need to estimate additional parameters or pick a more complex model, maybe move to the uh, to one of the um, uh, other two models? And then uh, you go through the cycle a few times and hopefully uh, at some point it works and then you can answer your question. And to illustrate, uh, to give you a few more examples of what this could look like in practice, uh, I, I, I would just briefly introduce a few studies. So this is work from Marta Garrido, and she used a roving paradigm. So it's a sequence of tones. And sometimes the sequence uh, changes frequency, and then there's a couple of tones in the lower frequency, and then in the higher frequency. You can see this also here. And uh, if you subtract, if you're here on the right-hand side, you can see the response to the sixth tone, so a tone that a person got used to hearing, and a tone when a, a, a change in frequency occurred, which is also called an oddball tone. And you can see that the oddball response is much uh, stronger. And if you subtract uh, these two responses, you get a difference waveform and you will get a negative deflection around 200 milliseconds. And that's called the mismatch negativity. And uh, Marta wanted to understand what network uh, explains the mismatch negativity best. So she compared models with different regions. And this is OK here, because you always fit it to the same data. Wouldn't be OK if you were extracting LFPs and modeling the LFPs, and suddenly you had two more LFPs. So it's OK here, because you use the same data. Um, and what she, what she did was she compared a network with two, four, or five regions. And then at the bottom here, the first region uh, had an additional parameter here, which estimated the excitability of primary auditory cortex. And what you found is that model comparison favored the model with five regions and this uh, change or the regulation in, of excitability in this primary auditory region. This is a second example. Uh, uh, in, in another paper, Marta uh, answered, uh, tried to ask the question, are backward connections required to explain the mismatch negativity? So she compared two different uh, models with and without backward connections. And then she did something quite interesting. So she fit these models to uh, different amounts of data. So up to 100 milliseconds, up to 190 milliseconds, up to 200 milliseconds, and so on until to 60 milliseconds, and then you can compute a log base factor. So it's the difference between the evidence for this model and that model. And if this is positive, it favors the model with feedback connections. And if it's negative, it favors 
a model with only feed forward collection. So you can see the longer the time, the more evidence or the more the model with feedback connections was favored. So it suggests for longer periods, you need feedback connections if you want to mod model uh, later signals, essentially. And you can also see this here in the plots where she showed uh, the predicted and observed response. You can see that the one without backward connections did not model the late responses as well. The third example is this uh, study here by a, a former colleague of mine, Andre Schmidt, who uh, was interested in how ketamine affects connectivity during the mismatch negativity, because ketamine is uh, known to reduce mismatch negativity, and you want to understand uh, how this could be explained, TCM. And he used uh, Marta's, essentially Marta's model space and allowed the uh, condition to be to modulate different regions, for example, forward, backward, forward and backward. And then you also had the, this excitability in A1 parameter, but again in A1. And you found that the best model in both populations was uh, the full model. But then he was interested is, so uh, there seemed to be the same model underlying uh, ketamine and no ketamine. And then he basically wanted to test whether the, the difference in ketamine can be better explained by a change in the st connectivity strength rather than the absence or presence of a parameter. And he indeed found that the subjective effects under ketamine correlated with a uh, uh, reduced uh, forward connectivity from A1 uh, to SDG. And last example, uh, Dario Shirby uh, uh, was interested in the role of muscarinic receptor function for mismatch negativity uh, generation. And it's another beautiful paper, which I recommend reading. So it's again, the awful task, who would have thought, uh, but this time in rats. And there was a pharmacologic intervention. Uh, so uh, rats received muscarine receptor agonist uh, scopolamine or uh, pedocarpine, uh, which antagonizes uh, muscarinic receptors in different doses and placebo as well. And there were epidural recordings and Dari used the canonical microcircuit, the LFP version of that to model this data. Uh, he used a two network model with A1 and PNF and then allowed uh, different connections to be modulated during the mismatch activity to explain the difference between deviant and standards in all of these different combinations. And you can see that the picture here was not quite clear in some cases, in some drug conditions, the high dose pedocarpine, for example, this uh, most complex model mod allowing modulation of all the collections was favored and some it was not so clear. So he's, he then averaged the parameters across these different models and found that some of them show a dose dependent uh, or a dose dependent relationship that mirrors the, the dose or the change in muscarinic receptor function that we assume. So he tested for linear trends and found some of these parameters for which are have been hypothesized to be influenced uh, uh, or involved uh, in muscarinic receptor function. Uh, showed these effects, for example, the kernel gain or the time constant of the synaptic kernel. And so this is quite an interesting study as well. And so with that, uh, we have done it all now. We have uh, talked about interesting question, what to think about when collecting data, pre-processing data, how to specify your model space, how to invert the model, uh, and uh, what you need to do to check your results. And then hopefully, once you've done all that, you can answer your own questions. And then hopefully, we see each other sometime here uh, in London at the Queen's Ladder to celebrate your uh, success. And uh, here are some more resources. There are some nice overview papers, some more in-depth reading. There's a lot of information also in the SPM manual. And I also highly recommend these other courses here, the relationship psychiatry course in Zurich. There's online material, which you can watch the KCNI summer school. And uh, I would also like to thank my uh, colleagues and collaborators from our lab and also other here from UCL and uh, you for your attention. And uh, I hope uh, now we can have 
uh, some discussion or you can ask me some questions. If not, there's also going to be uh, another opportunity, I think, to uh, answer uh, to ask questions. Uh, yeah, and with that, thank you so much for listening to this.